Can we say loud amen? In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's be seated. Sir, a little game. Let's be seated. I want to appreciate each and every one of us. I was in my spirit scanning for her, like where is she? Lo and behold, she is here. So it's good to see our faces. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Amen. I want to welcome us to another important edition of Disciples Convocation. I believe our week has started very well. For those who are joining online, thank you for being part of this meeting. Please stay to the end and be blessed by God in Jesus' name. Amen. Some weeks ago, we looked through the kingdom experience from part one to part eight. And I think it was a glorious experience. Uh, for some of us, we may need to go back to the series to, uh, is it Parus now, or to regurgitate, to rekindle the fire, to reignite the fire. So tonight, I believe the Lord wants to start us on another series, whether it will be eight or eighty or two, it will be left for God to determine. So what we are looking at is looking unto Jesus. That's the new series. Looking on to Jesus. Some people even wanted to finish it. The what? And the of our faith. All right. You know, I don't know why many of us don't like talking. Sorry, your voice will not disturb recording. It will not disturb what other people will benefit. Your voice is how I get to know that we are together here. So please let us not keep it, Bro Francis. Let me hear your voice next time. Uh, what I would love such statement to be completed by men that are students of the Bible. Looking unto Jesus. You can put part one if you so desire. So we are starting from the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and we'll be reading from verse 1 perhaps to verse 11. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 1 to verse 11. Looking unto Jesus. From verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily esnares us, which so easily traps us, which so easily imprisons us which so easily keeps us in captivity or keeps us in bondage. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, if you want to look again from that verse 1, the Bible says, we are surrounded by a great, a great cloud of weaknesses. We are surrounded. We are not alone. Whatever we are into now, we are not likely going to be the first to be into it. Whatever experiences that we are having right now, we are not going to be the only one having those experiences. We are surrounded. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that traps us, that keeps us back, that keeps us from moving forward, that prevents us from attaining the purpose of God for our lives, that prevents us from becoming the celebrity that God has destined us to be, that prevent us from becoming the great man, the great woman that God had ordained us. There is something that trusts us. You know, sometimes it's possible for a Christian or a believer to live a life of rising and falling and rising and falling. So it doesn't matter that the believer is rising. The devil is not angry because the devil knows the believer will what? Descend. So even though we could spend 30 years in the church, 
30 years following Jesus, if it is all about rising and falling, rising and falling, then there is no big deal with our lives. So every moment that we fall from the beginning to now, these are the moments where we've been trapped. Bible says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us. My life must not follow a wrong pattern of rising today, falling tomorrow. Ignited today, quenched tomorrow. Excited today, sad tomorrow. I must not, you know, like they say, having mood swing. I must not be a man given to mood swing. Don't come to me today. I'm in the wrong side of my life. Come tomorrow. It mustn't be like that. We mustn't be a people that are full of faith at a point and then we are completely drained of faith at another point. We mustn't be a people that confess so much. I'm going to be great. And later on when they come to you, you say nothing good can ever come from your Nazarite. That is a man rising and falling. Something, a weight is ensnaring you. A weight is trapping you. Imagine that when we look at our lives today, every good thing that we can think of is a result of the good confessions of our mouth. Do we now think we confess good every day of our lives? Are there no days we make negative confessions? If there are days, then we can conclude that anything that is not good in your life today and in my life today is a product of our negative confessions. So when you are I, you were confessing positively. When you were low, you were confessing negatively. However, both the positive and the negative have impact on your life. So the moment of your negative confessions are the moment that you have been ensnared. I just don't like somebody talking to me like that. It gets me off. <laughs> Those moments of your offness. <laughs> The words you say in those moments, you will still repeat. So the Bible says, let us lay it aside. Bible says, let us run with endurance. I wonder why an endurance is required in this race. The race is long, difficult, and sometimes lonely. So the Bible says, run this race with endurance. If you will not be having a moment of off, that will, that's not off. If you will not be having a moment of on and off, on and off, then you require endurance. That period that you were trapped, you were ensnared, let's say that moment you could not endure. That moment you could not handle it. You could not tolerate it. You could not persevere. You could not hold on. You could not continue doing good. You just felt like giving up. I've been laboring. What do I have to show? I've been sacrificing. What do I have to show? I've been praying. You know that song that says, We've been praying. We've been sowing. Now we are asking heaven for the rain. Do you know it? You know, sometimes when I know you don't know some songs, I feel good. <laughs> ah. Probably, when some people that have been quiet don't know some, some songs that you know, you should feel what? Good. <laughs> they say, we are asking the heaven for the rain. Imagine you have been sowing, you have been doing everything, and you can't sh show something. Nothing to take home. So you can give up. That moment that you choose to give up, you could no more endure it. You know, the Bible says at the latter times, people will no longer be able to endure sound doctrine. That means they've tolerated it to a point. They can't endure it again. The truth is killing us. <laughs> this truth is keeping us away from enjoying life. What my mates are going through, I can't go through it. This truth is keeping me. Let me join them if I cannot beat them. So you could no more endure it. So if we are going to run this race to the end, this race that we are surrounded in, 
this race that has the capacity, that has inherent capacity in it to weigh us or to trap us due to our lack of endurance or tiredness. The Bible says we must run this race with endurance. Now, to help us have a better perspective, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, you are not going to look at your church. You will not look at the fathers of faith. You will not even look at the mothers of faith. This is not the time to look at the brothers and sisters of faith. You will not look at your country. You will not look at your friends. You will not look at your bank accounts. You will not look about lack of friends or presence of friends. You will not look at the number of followers you have on your social media. You will not look at those things. What do you do? You look unto Jesus. And the reason is simple. If you look at the other things, you could run to a, a, to a degree. You could try. But there will come a time when that your tryness <laughs> will become exhausted and you will no longer be able to endure. So that you don't claim, after all, I got to a good degree because of where my money could take me. I just couldn't go further because I didn't have enough money. It's not going to be a progress by money. It must be a progress by Jesus. You will not go as far as your money can take you, as far as your friends can take you, as far as goodwill, people's appreciation of you can take you. You will go as far as Jesus can take you. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the initiator, the starter, and finisher, the concluder, <laughs> the ender. You know, those words are not, uh, <laughs> they are not really in the dictionary directly, right? Of our faith. You know, the Bible, my Bible puts our faith, especially the hour in italics, putting emphasis there. But I also want to emphasize faith perhaps more than the hour. So I would like to join the two of them together, our faith. Jesus has to be the subject and the object of our focus because what we call our faith, he was the one that started it. What we call our faith, he was the one that finished it. He began it, he ended it. All we will ever be will be within him. <laughs> you can't outperform, outprogress, outdo, outthink, out at work this faith more than Jesus. So you can't say, no, there's something I'm trying to prove. I want to show Jesus that I can do what he could not do. You know, I just want to prove a point because if you live your life trying to prove to Jesus that you can do what he could not do, a time is coming you will no longer be able to endure even the things that Jesus endured. So, the Bible didn't say, look unto Jesus so that you can break his record. The Bible says, look unto him. There's a place in Isaiah when God himself said, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah. He says, for I called him alone. So, when God is telling you to look to, God is trying to tell you, pattern your life after him. Let him be your model. Another word is follow him. So the series that we are starting is a series that brings us into, into that consciousness that Jesus is not a name we should just mention. Jesus is the one to become. He's the one to follow. He's the one to pattern after. So when life brings challenges at your doorpost, when the challenges of life knock the door of your heart. You will not respond as your fathers have taught you or your uncles have taught you. You will respond as Jesus is teaching you. You will not respond and say, people of my culture, this is how they deal with this matter. You know, there's this uh, comedy series on uh, is, is it Mnet or M, 
what they call those all those channels now on DSTV. Flat meat. There's a man they call chief. Anytime he wants to say something, we say, My people, eh, my people say, I mean, is it my people say or what? Who has the exact way he put it? My people say, okay, my people say, aha. You know, some people will say, the elders are saying, this is what the elders. My people say, when you see a fly that is flying and he has jumped or he has passed where he's supposed to land, that means that fly is a misfly. You know, we just say something like that. My people say. So, even though he says oftentimes rubbish, he gives the impression that it is possible for a man to be in Lagos and his life to be governed by what my people in the village are saying. So you could be living somewhere else and the things you do, the clothes you wear, the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you carry yourself, the things you eat is informed by, by what your people do, what they dress and how they behave. It, it doesn't matter location. Myself and my wife we were watching a particular video about the culture of Yoruba and how it has spread all over the world, especially in the Caribbeans. Brazil, Cuba, you know, through the slave trade, how they migrated many Yoruba people. Now, even though they were slaves in Cuba and all those places, and they had to be speaking Spanish and Portuguese, they went there with their religion. So they were not in their houses, they were not in their places of baths. They were not in the ancestral places, but yet they were doing the things that their people were doing, even though they were thousands of miles away. So if they would do anything there, they would ask themselves, what do, what, what do our people do? <laughs> Sister Joy, you don't have a way of helping somebody with English. What is the manner of our people? How do they do? in situations like this? How do they do marriage? Get married? How do they do this? How do they do that? When they give birth to a child, what do they do? They will not say, what does Jesus say? They will say, what do our people do? They normally do like this, so let's do it like that. Now, if you don't want to continue to live your life on a lower level, the Bible says, you look unto Jesus. You know, by the way, these people that are traditionalists, they look unto men that have lived thousands of years. Some of their gods are people like them that have lived, right? And so, they still pattern their lives after those people who had issues in their lives. But the Bible says, don't pattern your life after those who have issues in their lives. You look unto Jesus. Let him be your model. When Jesus was teaching, he says, when they slap you in one place, Brother Dennis, turn the other one. Now, if you slap Brother Dennis on a good day, in a place where he doesn't know anybody, that is, Brother John is not there, Brother Francis is not there, and they slap him, somebody slap him, we Brother Dennis turn the other one, it's a serious challenge. Even though Jesus could have admonished, the question is, what does his culture admonish? Imagine if the person that slapped him is a young lady. <laughs> Matter has now gotten worse, right? So, when we re react, when we treat people, when we relate with people, do we relate based on what our culture teaches us or on what Jesus teaches us? There's a scripture that Brobi normally quotes in those days, and I think it's in Titus. I don't know the exact place. It says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ has appeared to all men. Yes, thank you. Teaching us. And the, the grace of God that the Bible was talking about is the person of Jesus. The grace of God has appeared to all men. Teaching us. So what does Jesus teach you? The way you treat your wife or the way you treat your husband, is that the way Jesus teach you? The way you conduct yourself in your neighborhood, in your streets, is that the way Jesus teach you? Or the way you think people of your family behave? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If you are going to have, see, that our faith, just call it our life. And you remember Jesus had a different life promise. 
He said, the thief comes but to steal. John 10, 10. The thief comes but to steal, to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. That abundant life is our faith. And uh, if you want to pattern your life after that kind of life, then you cannot rely on your tradition. You can't even rely on your brain, intelligence. You can't rely on your stimulus or your, your stimulus, uh, the things that are stimulating within you. You can't re rely on your omuna <laughs> dictations. Your omu is saying, do like this, you do like that. You cannot limit your life to that. Because there is a higher life in Christ Jesus that you must learn from Jesus to be perfect in that life. And if what this message this day can do to you is to challenge you to remember that there is a life that is more than this life and you can only live that life in Jesus, I think that would be good. Look at it. Who for the joy that was set before him the Bible says he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't know anybody here that God has given a word at for time, and the world looks beautiful. That word is like the joy that is set ahead of you. God says, Don't worry, although your beginning may be small, your latter hand will be greatly increased. And now, you don't even have money to buy the things you need. You don't have food. You don't have clothes. That is the joy that is set before you versus the cross. <laughs> you know the word cross has two meanings for me here. You know, cross is number one. That thing that they hang Jesus on. Hmm? Who for the cross? That's the cross. The second thing about cross is the word, the action word to cross. Bro Francis, let us cross to the other side. <laughs> Between who you are and who you must be, there's a cross. Let me not call it a bridge. But let's call it a cross. Between where you are and where you are going in life, there's a cross. The man you are, the man you must be, there's a cross. The people we are and the people we must be. There's a cross. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured the process. Between now and then, the future, there is a process. Having fully satisfied the conditions, what happens to us? We get into the joy. We get into the promised land. We get into the promised experience. That thing that God promised us, we get into it. The child that God promised you, you give back to the child. The house that God promised you, you get into the house. The business that God promised you, you get into the business. The ministry that God promised you, you step into the ministry. The land that God promised you, you step into the land. How do you get there? You have to pass through the cross. And what did Jesus do concerning the cross? The Bible says he, he endured it. He despised the shame thereof. So what are we going through now that looks <laughs> endurance demanding? That looks shame prone? <laughs> the Bible says what do you do? Endure it. Endure it like a man that has a father in heaven. You see, when an orphan is struggling and, you know, he, you know, he's going through a difficult situation, and a man that has a father is going through a difficult situation, hmm? the man that has a father knows he has a father, and he knows who the father is. There are two different things. One is a bit hopeless, the one has hope. When you were in university, let's, let's use a hypothetical example. Let's say when you were in university, your daddy was sending money to you. Let's say when you were investing, there was no daddy to send money to you. Don't make it look real. <laughs> now, when you, you, the month gets to 15th of the month, and then maybe two of you don't have money to eat, 
Who will have hope between two of you that money will come? Is it you? The one who has a father, do you understand? Not an irresponsible father. Father. Why? You believe your father will show up. So when you are enduring, please don't endure like an orphan. Jesus said, I don't want you to have the mindset of orphans. A people who have no father. No. I will not leave you as orphans. So don't think you are. So the Holy Spirit is a father figure in your life and destiny. He said, I will give you another helper. He is your father, he is your helper. You have him. So when you are passing through that difficult situation in your life now, pass it with the consciousness that you have a father who is responsible. And after you have suffered for a while, what will he do? He will perfect you. That's what we have in 1 Peter 5.10. He will establish you. He will strengthen you. He will set you. Why? You have been, you have gone through that suffering for a while. So if you omit the suffering for a while, forget the establishment, forget the strength, forget the settlement. Your God is not unfaithful. <laughs> Do you get? But imagine a man who has no label of love. <laughs> Even though your God has good memory, <laughs> he doesn't forget. There's nothing to remember. Our God is not unfaithful. When you labor in love, he will reward you. But what about you don't labor? So that endurance is like you laboring. The Bible says in all labor there is profit. If you labor where God has asked you to labor, labor on what God has asked you to labor, labor over what God asks you to labor, there is a profit. And when you are laboring, don't labor as an orphan. Labor, and I'm saying this again and again, labor as one who has a responsible father. You know, when they pray a prayer in Psalm, it says, The abundance of the heavens above and the fatness of the earth beneath. There's so much fatness on the earth, but there is something else from above. What is it? The abundance. Everything that comes from above is above. When water is coming from above, it's beyond what you have here. If God should decide to rain gold, you will be wondering, Is this gold or diamond? And God will say, That you still go do, but this is a different gold. <laughs> This is, a, this is a heavenly good. Whatever comes from above is better, is different, is higher. So when you know that you have a father in heaven, you should understand that you are connected to a supply that is abundant. So you are not suffering because there is no hope. You are suffering in hope that tomorrow will be alright. Don't suffer and every time you are suffering, you are making everybody to be getting angry with God. If God is a responsible God, he shouldn't allow you to suffer. So God is not even taking glory in your suffering. God is brought to shame in your suffering. So how do you expect him to help you? But you are suffering. People know that uh, your father is a rich man. Huh? And they know you are suffering. They know there is a message that your father wants to pass across with this experience. Go and read the Bible. You will see instances where God makes people to go through things. Not because he doesn't have power. To save them, but because he wanted to pass a message across. You will see this scripture that we are reading. I don't know whether we'll finish the reading this week. But there's a part of it. Let's just skip it. I mean, let's jump it. So that we can just read that place. Don't forget what I said. We are, we are jumping, but we we'll still come back. Hebrews chapter 12. And let's read from verse 7. So that we can connect with what I said last. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chast chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? 
For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profits in all labor what? There is profit. That we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful. You remember that place we read earlier? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Yeah, the Bible says no chastening seems to be joyful. But there is a joy ahead. But the chastening is not joyful. So let's not forget it. He says, joyful for the present, but painful. So are you going through pain right now? Are you listening to me online and you are going through pain right now? It's understandable. Nevertheless, afterward, this your pain is not supposed to be forever. <laughs> it's supposed to be for a time. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So this your cross this your suffering, this your pain, the Bible calls it, you are being trained. You are trained by who? Your father. And if you are not a bastard, what does the Bible say? You must be chastened. Sir, what did you say, sir? You must endure the process. You must be chastened. If you look at your life now for the last three years, you have never gone through anything that looks challenging. Start asking yourself. <laughs> you know, the Bible says concerning Jesus, although he, the son, yes, he learned obedience. He learned submission by the things he suffered. So skip the suffering. Where will he learn from? So are we going through our times? Mr. Joy, Bro Guega, Bro John, Bro Francis. Are we going through our times? Hmm? Or we are going through other times? <laughs> the Bible says God is training us. I have a father who never fails. I have a father who never... Bro, bro John, he's a father. I have a father who we never fail. Ah, Jesus never fails. My father never failed. <laughs> Bro, I don't know if I have disappointed you in the past. Like I'm singing, suddenly I stop. You know, we always improvise. You know, I was telling my wife today, that is a gift. It's a gift. I was telling her that many of the rhymes in primary school, I never knew them. I was always joining them. I never knew them. And the thing has not stopped. So what do I do now? Because I'm more uh, older. So I fill in the unknown ones with my own words. If the thing is the God and me, I come with Father, we continue. If it is never, never, I will say, we never, never. Fail. You know, let's the thing just continue. So let us also not be boxed. It's about expressing your heart. And you can never be wrong expressing your heart. It's your heart. <laughs> so what are we learning here? You know, verse 6 Hebrews 12 it says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son, not minding the age, the color, the complexion of that son. He scourges every son whom he receives. So as God received you, then he will, he will what? He will scourge you. That's what the Bible says. And this is a man that has had experiences with God. So when you are being scorched, when you are going through that cross, when you are going through that thing that you need endurance for, don't say, I'm going through this because I'm an unbeliever, because I'm unfaithful, because God doesn't love me, because God doesn't have plan for me. Other, in, in, in reality, you are going through it because you are important to God. There is something that your life must bat. The Bible calls it a peaceable fruit of righteousness. You know, today, myself and my wife were also listening to a message where Dr. Maismura said there are two priorities in life as far as God is concerned for us. It is the kingdom and the righteousness of God. <laughs> Do you remember? He said, seek first the kingdom and then I say, and is righteousness. Not it is God's righteousness. So, the Fruit of righteousness connotes anything you can produce in the righteousness of God. 
anything that you produce in your alignment with God, in you following the will of God for your life, is a fruit of righteousness. And that will not come if you never cross or carry your cross. So while you are carrying your cross, if you will not faint and fail, then you must endure. It will not be easy. It will not be rosy. Nobody will celebrate you. You must endure. You must endure. Today we say Jesus. Sometimes something wants to follow. Let me say Jesus. Every time, Jesus, Jesus. How many times did they say Jesus in the days of Jesus? Many of us, we, we sometimes envy Jesus, but if, you, if they put you in the shoe of Jesus, you will want to run away. A dry land. Now we are riding cars now. There was no car to ride. Apart from the time he entered the temple on the donkey, he was always trekking. Imagine trekking from here to Lokoja. Trekking from here to Abaji. <laughs> For those in Lagos, trekking from uh, Oshodi to <laughs> Ojota, uh, you know. There was a time I went to, I've, I've shared the story. I went to, I left my university to buy a computer in Lagos, Ikeja. So my mommy, my transport now finished in uh, Oshodi <laughs> when I was coming back. I was carrying monitor on my head. You know those monitors that look like TV with back? So the money I had, if at all I want to use it to transport, can only get me to Ibadan, and I was going to Ife. So I, there was no opportunity to ride any. So I was looking for any cheap. I had to trek from Oshodi to Ojota. I was just trekking. There was one five naira. I don't know. I think it's five naira pure water that time. So I just said, let me just buy pure water. As soon as I collect pure water, I finished the entire pure water instantly. And I was carrying the monitor like this. I went through and experienced that. Day. That was the last time I made that foolish. You know, when you are in the Keja, computer village, mommy, you will be buying things that you don't even have money for. <laughs> so since then, anytime I go to Lagos, I will keep tofu in another pocket. Money for anything, another point. So I can't finish the transport. I don't touch it. <laughs> so when I was in that experience too, in Ojota, maybe I must have endured it. So now I have been trained by it. So I don't know whether I've learned my lesson or I'm still making the mistake. <laughs> but God will take us through experiences. The son that the father loves, it chastens. God will expose you. You know, there was a time we were learning about shining as light. A lamp. When you lighten a lamp, don't put it under. Put it up. It's not easy. When you start shining, people will be angry with your brightness. Is it the only one that can shine? Now only you will come. You know, people will say all manner of things. It will bring your life on the spot. People will hate you. People will afflict you. People will want to do anything against you. Yet God has exposed you. But God who exposed you will not leave you alone. Whatever your life needs to go through, why becoming the man that you must become, God would allow you to pass through it. For the joy that is set ahead of you, it is that joy that warrants all your sufferings. <laughs> if your life has no future joy, you will suffer now. So those Yahoo Yahoo boys now that are making millions. You know, they are driving big cars and they are do it, do it, do it, do it. And then they put the trousers at the back, you know, and they are smoking weed. And then when they drink a bottle, a bottle is like some people's salary, a bottle. And then after a few years, you just hear that the guy, he, maybe the, he went to, you know, sometimes they, they, this crime is a network. You start with cheating on the computer. Before you know it, you start stopping people on the road. You start robbing people in the houses. So they say they killed him. So he enjoyed briefly. There was no joy ahead of him. The joy was for him at the present. So don't be eager. Don't be desperate for instant joy. This is your specialized joy that God has packaged for you that is ahead of you. It's not any lesser than the present joy of other people. Your own joy, because it's delayed, doesn't mean it's less. It doesn't mean it's inferior. Your joy is great joy. Greater joy awaits you. Greater joy lies ahead of you. You that you are laughing last, you could be the one laughing best. So don't feel any less. 
Those who are rising today, they may be no more tomorrow. So stick with God. Learn along the way. Endure the process so that you come out having been trained with the peaceable fruits of righteousness. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, part one, I want to invite Sister Lara to come and pray with us as we leave this place. And I trust that as we prepare for next week, the Lord will guide us further towards looking unto Jesus and enjoying the life that God has for us. For listening to this transformative word, I believe you have been blessed. For inquiries, contact us at centerndl.org, email us at info at centerndl.org, and you can call us on our line 080 344 55678 or 080 67 29-6988 Letters can be sent to P.O. Box 126 Bwari Abuja Remember, life is to be lived by design not by default Loving the world only robs you of ruling it Be in charge